This is lecture 34 on chapter 11.5, 11.7 through 11.9 on colligative properties. So colligative properties are properties that depend only on the amount of dissolved, dissolved solute and not on a solute's chemical identity. And so some examples of these colligative properties are uh, lowering of vapor pressure, the elevation of boiling point, and the depression of freezing point, and also um, observe changes in osmotic pressure. And so colligative properties we can use to describe the, the uh, change in freezing point for melting ice on the roads. So we know that when, we, when uh, you have winter weather that comes in, that the public works department will drop salt on the roads in order to uh, melt the salt and make it safe to drive. So why is it that, that putting down salt actually clears that ice. And so the answer behind that is because of this colligative property. So the, the, the process of dissolving that, that salt into the, that uh, water ice will have the effect of depressing the freezing point, which will in turn, uh, turn the, convert the frozen solid ice, water ice, into liquid again, making the road safe to drive on. And so we know through through experience that the more salt that you put down, the more it's going to depress that freezing temperature. The less salt you put down, the less it's going to be effective. Okay, so this lines up with our definition here of a colligative property being such that depends only on the amount of dissolved solute and not on the solute's chemical identity. And so here we're talking about dissolving a, a solute into a solvent. And so when we're talking about the amount of solute that's dissolved into a solvent, we have to consider the concentration. So we have several different units of concentration. The one unit of concentration is molarity, and that's given to us here by our capital M symbol. And so molarity is defined as moles of solute over the liters of solvent, or the liters of the solution entirely. We have the mole fraction, which is the total moles of the component over the total moles making up the solution. Okay, and so we saw mole fraction come in when we talked about our, our various components within a mixture of gases. But this mole fraction definition here goes to, um, to solutions and really any other sample that you're working with. We have mass percent, which is the mass of the component over the total mass of solution times 100. And then finally, molality, which is given to us by lowercase m, and that is the moles of solute over the mass of solvent in kilograms. Okay, so typically we see our, our aqueous solutions being referred to in terms of molarity, okay, the moles of solute over liters of solution. But when we're dealing with colligative properties, and so many of those colligative properties that we introduced on the last slide have to deal with events that occur at varying different temperatures, okay? Whether you're talking about freezing points or boiling points or vapor pressures, these are all temperature dependent factors. And so because of that, we need to incorporate a concentration unit that is in itself temperature independent, that is not affected by temperature. And so molarity itself here, molarity with a capital M, is a temperature dependent term. So how is molarity temperature dependent? So if we think about the, the volume of a specific amount of liquid water, okay, so assume that we have liquid water that weighs 100 grams. And so this liquid water is at 25 degrees Celsius, so approximately room temperature. As we increase the temperature of this water to say 90 degrees Celsius, this water, so at approximately 25 degrees Celsius, we know the density of water is such that one milliliter of water is approximately one gram. So this 100 grams at 25 degrees C is approximately 100 milliliters. But we know as we increase the temperature of the water, we're going to see an expansion of that liquid water such that this, this water is now going to be greater than 100 milliliters in volume. Okay, so this molarity, the moles of, so of solute over the liters of solution, this liters term is in itself temperature dependent. 
meaning that the concentration in molarity can change slightly depending on what specific temperature that you're speaking of the solution. Whereas if we take a look down at our molality term here on the bottom, where we have the moles of solute over the mass of solvent in kilograms, this 100 grams of water that we spoke of will weigh 100 grams no matter what temperature that we're dealing with. Whether we're dealing at 25 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Celsius, or 1 degree Celsius, it will always weigh exactly 100 grams. So this molality term that we have here is going to be temperature independent. So this molality term that's temperature independent, excuse me for that, the molality term which is temperature independent is going to be the concentration term that we use for any considerations having to do with colligative properties. And so here's just a quick summation of all of our different types of, of uh, concentration units here and some of the advantages and disadvantages of each type of unit, including whether they are temperature dependent or temperature independent. So when we're talking about colligative properties, one of the key concepts that, that we deal with is the changing in the boiling point or the freezing point. And so we have two different equations given to us here for delta temperature of boiling, so change in boiling temperature or change in freezing temperature. We have one equation for non-electrolytes and another equation for electrolytes. Okay, and so let's take a look. So the change in either boiling temperature or freezing temperature, is equal to a constant, so Kb or Kf, and so those constants are located down here in this table, so you have a Kb constant for changing in boiling point, or Kf constant, which is changing in freezing point, for each individual solvent. Okay, so in most conditions here, we'll be dealing with water, but we can look up whatever sort of solvent that we're talking about. So we have a Kb term, or a Kf term, which is a constant dependent on the solvent. We have our lowercase m, which is going to be our concentration in molality. So again, that's moles over kilograms of solvent, times the i, which is what's called the von Hoff factor. And so the von Hoff factor i is the moles of particles in solution over moles of solute dissolved. So again, we're talking about changing the boiling point or the freezing point of a solution. So say that we have a solution that has water as a solvent, and then we have a solid solute that's going to be added. Okay, so say that this is sodium chloride or could be glucose, calcium chloride, could be anything. The solid is going to be added in. So we can say the moles of our solute and then being dissolved in our solvent. Okay, so let's talk about this von Hoff factor for a moment. So we know that colligative properties depend on the amount of sample that is dissolved, not on the identity of the sample. And this von Hoff factor is equal to the moles of particle in solution over moles of solute dissolved. So let's see what that actually means. So let's consider dissolving a few different materials in water. So if we first dissolve sodium chloride solid in water, we know that since sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte, it's gonna break up totally in solution to Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. So if we put in one mole of that solid sodium chloride, we know it's gonna break up, break up into equal parts, whereas we have one mole of Na plus and one mole of Cl minus. So if we take a look at the total number of particles that are in solution, we now have two moles total of particles there in solution. And so our definition of particles for colligative properties is anything, any material that's in solution. So we're talking atoms, ions, molecules, large molecules, small molecules, any sort of material that is dissolved in your, your solvent is considered a particle. Even though these ions are quite small, we're dealing with two moles total of particles. So if we calculate our von Hoff factor, which again is going to be our number of moles of particles in solution, so in this case we'll have two moles of our particles in solution, over the number of moles of our solute that we put in, which is one mole, we can see our von Hoff factor here is equal to two, 
for sodium chloride. So now let's consider if we put in calcium chloride. So calcium chloride, solid, is also a strong electrolyte. So we know that that's going to break in, into calcium 2 plus aqueous plus 2 Cl minus aqueous. So if we put in one mole of calcium chloride, we're going to get one mole of calcium 2 plus and two moles of chloride ions. So therefore, if we take a look at the total moles of particles, we have three total moles of particles in solution. So therefore, our von Hoff factor is going to be three moles over one mole three moles of particles over one more mole of, of our solute that we put in. So our von Hoff factor is equal to three. Whereas if we take a look at a non-electrolyte, for example, glucose, solid, when we put glucose in solution, it doesn't break up into any smaller parts. It doesn't break up into any additional particles. So solid glucose turns into aqueous glucose. So if we had one mole of glucose we put in, we only have one mole of glucose total in solution. So our von Hoff factor, I, is one mole of particles over one mole of solute. Von Hoff factor is equal to one. Okay, so if we think about our, our boiling or freezing point elevation, where we have our delta T, say for boiling, is equal to our constant Kb times our molality lowercase m times our von Hoff factor i, okay? Or if we're talking about the change in our temperature for freezing point, equal to negative our Kf constant for freezing times our molality times our concentration i. If we take a look at these, we can identify which one of these materials is going to change the temperature of freezing point the largest? So we know that this K term here, whether it's Kb or Kf, is a constant that is determined by the specific solvent that we're using. The M is our molality, which is our concentration, says how much of that, that material that we're dissolving, and I is our von Hoff factor. So we can see a direct relationship between the magnitude of our von Hoff factor and the amount that's going to change either the boiling or the freezing temperature. So the higher the von Hoff factor, the higher or the larger the magnitude of the change of either the temperature of boiling or the temperature of freezing. So we would see that calcium chloride would produce the largest change in either temperature or freezing or boiling uh, point. We would see that glucose with a von Hoff factor of one would be the lowest magnitude of change. And sodium chloride is going to be towards the middle. And the reason for that is simply because of the magnitude of their specific von Hoff factor. OK, so it's important to notice that the um, it's important to note here that this von Hoff factor, so we know the idea of a strong electrolyte totally dissociates in solution. So therefore, our von Hoff factor would be a, equal to the number of particles that it breaks up into in the solution. Okay, so we can see sodium chloride breaks up into two particles. Von Hoff factor is two. Calcium chloride breaks up into three particles, so you have von Hoff factor of three. But in reality, the von Hoff factor isn't always, the, the dissociation isn't always complete. So therefore, the von Hoff factor sometimes, instead of being 2, in reality, this von Hoff factor might be equal to, say, 1.9. Or this von Hoff factor, instead of 3, might be equal to, say, 2.8. Okay? So in reality, the von Hoff factor isn't as uh, cut and dry, but the same sort of ideas of how it relates to the equation um, exists. So with that, let's take a look at an example of a problem. So what is the freezing point in degrees Celsius of a solution prepared by dissolving 7.40 grams of magnesium chloride in 110 grams of water? The von Hoff factor for magnesium chloride is equal to 2.7. So pause the video and work through this for a moment on your own. Okay, so we're dealing with our equation. 
for our colligative properties, stating that the delta T for our, we're talking about our freezing point, so this would be delta T F is equal to negative K F times our molality times our Hoff factor. So we're given our KF value from our, our table down here below. We're given our von Hoff factor in the problem. We just need to determine this molality term. So we know that molality is defined as the moles of solvent, or sorry, the moles of solute over the mass of your solvent. And that mass is in kilograms. So let's solve for this molality term first. So molality is equal to, um, excuse me, before we do that, we actually need to determine what the number of moles of solute that we have from our number of grams that's given to us. So we have 7.40 grams of magnesium chloride, measured value over one. And then we can look up our molar mass for magnesium chloride which is 95.211 grams of magnesium chloride per one mole. And that's going to equal 0.0777 moles of magnesium chloride that will be added to our solution. So therefore, we can say that our molality is equal to our number of moles, 0 0.0777 moles of MgCl2, over our mass of water in kilograms. Okay, so we have it in grams here, so we divide by 1,000 to say 0 0.110 kilograms of our solvent, which is water. And so that'll give us our molality concentration of 0 0.707 moles per kilogram. All right, so now we can now just plug and chug into our equation up here above. So we can see that our delta T F is equal to the negative, so we find our constant for water, so KB is for change in boiling point, we're dealing with KF, so for water we're dealing with 1.86 degrees Celsius kilograms over mole. All right, so we're going to input this guy, 1.86 degrees Celsius times kilogram over mole times our molality, 0 0.707 mole per kilogram times our von Hoff factor given to us in the problem as 2.7. And so we're going to see here that kilograms are going to cancel out, moles are going to cancel out, leaving us a final answer in degrees Celsius. When we plug and chug here, we see that our delta temperature for freezing will be equal to negative 3.55 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we, given the fact that colligative properties change the freezing point and boiling point of a material, this means that there should be an updated phase diagram associated with the addition of a solute into a, a, uh, into a solvent to make a solution. So if we take a look at an initial uh, phase diagram here for a material, and so the blue and red lines here talk about the, the uh, phase diagram for the solvent alone. After we dissolve a, a uh, solute into it to make a solution, we know that we have elevated our boiling point and we have lowered our freezing point. So therefore, the green lines here represent the changes in the phase diagram associated with the formation of a solution. So you're going to see that, that our, our um, uh, interface between liquid and gas is going to be moved to the bottom right, and our interface between liquid and solid is going to be moved to the left. So, given that knowledge, I ask you the question. 
The diagram presented in the image shows a close-up view of part of the vapor pressure curve for a pure solvent in a solution of a non-volatile solute. Which curve represents the pure solvent and which represents the solution? So take a moment. Okay, so the red line represents the pure solvent and the green line represents the solution. So as we saw in the last slide, we can see that the, that, uh, so the shape of this curve here represents that this would be our interchange between our liquid and gas phase. And we can see that the addition of the, uh, the solute to make a solution is going to push this curve to the bottom right. All right, I'll ask you another question. To the right are vapor pressure curves, uh, uh, or are the vapor pressure versus temperature plots for a pure solvent as well as some solvent containing one mole of sodium chloride or one mole of magnesium chloride? Which of the three lines is the vapor pressure curve for the solution that contains magnesium chloride? So take a minute and work through that. Okay, so here we're going to take a look at these three different curves. So we know that the addition of a, so again, this is going to be our interface going between our liquid and gas phase, just by the shape of these curves. And so we know that the addition of a solute to make a solution is going to cause these curves to go uh, lower and to the right. And so if we're talking about uh, pure solvent versus a solution, we know that A would definitely have to be our pure solvent. And so then now comparing between sodium chloride and magnesium chloride, which one we have to determine which one of these is going to have a larger effect on our boiling point. And so since we know that sodium chloride is going to have a von Hoff factor of approximately two, and magnesium chloride is going to have a von, von Hoff factor of approximately three, we know that magnesium chloride is going to have a larger effect than sodium chloride. So therefore, we can say that B will be the response from sodium chloride, and C would be the response from magnesium chloride. Okay, so next we want to talk briefly about osmosis. So osmosis is defined as the passage of solvent through a semi-permeable membrane from the less concentrated side to a more concentrated side. And the osmotic pressure, which is given to us by our symbol pi here, is the amount of pressure necessary to prevent net passage of solvent in osmosis. So diffusion is a, is a very important process in both just uh, uh, natural, the physical world, and also in biology. So things typically move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. Okay, so if you do not have a barrier, so if we bring a whiteboard up, so if we have a, an open solution, and we have, uh, so there's, there's no membrane or anything separating between the two. If you have a high concentration of, of a solute on one side, and so a high concentration of our solute on one side, and a very low concentration of our solute on the other side, what you're going to get is a process called diffusion. Diffusion, where those particles themselves are going to fuse from high concentration to low concentration. Diffusion is going to be our movement of particles from high concentration to low concentration. Okay, and so this is uh, due to a process called flux. Okay, and so the flux, uh, the equation and everything for flux and fixed laws are beyond the scope of this class, but diffusion is basically the movement of particles from high to low concentration. Okay, and so if you're in biology, you see this diffusion happening either actively or passively to restore membrane potentials. Um, it happens all over the place in, in, um, in the body. Okay, and so that is the process of, of uh, free diffusion of particles. What this osmosis is talking about is what if you have a vessel that is separated by what's called a semi-permeable membrane?
So what a semi-permeable membrane is, this is a material that allows solvent to move back and forth, but it does not allow solute to move. So what you're going to see is if you have a very high concentration of solute on one side of a semi-permeable membrane, so you have a high concentration of solute, Solute's very high, and on the other side, you see that the concentration of the solute is very low. What we're going to get, so you would have a low concentration of solute on the other side. So what's going to happen is this solvent is going to move across the semi-permeable membrane to try to equal out the concentrations on both sides. So in a normal sort of equilibrium, you're going to see solvent moving in both directions. But in this condition here, where you have a high concentration of solute on one side and a low concentration of solute on the other side, what you're going to see is a net movement of your solvent from right to left. So all of that movement is going to go in one direction. And the idea is it's going to try to increase the volume on the, on the side with the high concentration of solute. With the idea that we know that concentration is equal to moles over liter, if we increase the volume on the high concentration side by adding more solvent, that's going to lower the concentration and try to bring the concentrations on both sides of the semi-permeable membrane to a more equal value. And so the process of osmosis is talking about that movement of the solvent through that semi-permeable membrane from the less concentrated side to the more concentrated side to try to equalize that, that pressure difference uh, associated by the different concentrations. And so that osmotic pressure, which is the force which pushes that solvent across the semi-permeable membrane, is equal to our I, which is our von Hoff factor, our M, which is our molar concentration in molarity, our R, which is the ideal gas constant, times T, which is temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so that's going to be talking about that movement of that material across the semi-permeable membrane. And so we see this, this um, as I mentioned previously, this diffusion and, and osmosis the idea of moving from high pressure to low pressure and trying to equalize concentrations are um, observed all the time in, in biological systems. So what we're showing here are red blood cells. So in, in uh, photograph A, this is an image of healthy red blood cells. And so we see the red blood cells have this characteristic shape where they're sort of um, kind of like a hamburger bun, and but the, the middle of it has a slight dimple in it. And so this is a white or red blood cells that are in a normal sort of plasma concentration of a specific amount of salt in solution. Okay, because we know that there's salt inside, there's a salt concentration that's inside of these red blood cells, and there's a salt concentration in the solution on the outside, such that that, that uh, osmosis, that diffusion of solvent inside and outside is at an equilibrium. Okay, so this is a a uh, red blood cells in a buffer that mimics blood plasma. What this image here shows is red blood cells in pure water. Okay, so there is no external salt in this buffer. So what happens here, since there's a high concentration of salt and solute on the inside, Sorry for writing red on red here. A high concentration of salt on the inside of this, of this red blood cell and a low concentration of salt on the outside. What we're going to get is a diffusion of water across the membrane of this red blood cell to the inside. And so the idea is they're trying, we have a concentration which is going to be equal to our moles over liters. By having water go to the inside of these red blood cells, you're increasing the volume of water to try to lower the concentration on the inside of the red blood cell. And what this has the effect is it blows up the red, blo red blood cell like a balloon. And eventually it blows up so big 
that that red blood cell can pop. So that's why if you put blood in a pure water solution, you'll see eventually all of the red blood cells will totally puff up, pop, and then you won't have any more healthy blood cells to observe. And this is just the movement of water through osmotic pressure. Another example of, of osmotic pressure is the process of desalination by reverse osmosis. So desalination is the process of removing salt um, from uh, salt water. And so this is a method for purifying um, salt water from oceans and from seas into water that can theoretically be used for drinking. And so if you pump seawater in, separated by a semi-permeable osmotic membrane, you have a very high concentration of your salt on the one side, and you have a low concentration or a zero concentration pure water on the other side. So the osmotic pressure is going to want to push that pure water from the low concentration side to the high concentration side. And so there is an osmotic pressure that is pushing that water from one side to the other. So the reverse osmosis, the way this works, is you apply an external pressure into that saltwater side. That is that pressure that is going to be put in from the outside source is going to be greater than the osmotic pressure pushing from the right side to the left. And so what that's going to do is that's going to overcome this osmotic pressure and push that water across that osmotic membrane from the high concentration saltwater side to the low concentration side on the other. And then when you pull that water out, that can then be harvested as theoretical drinking water. So this sounds all well and good, but the amount of energy that's required to impart this pressure is so high that it makes this process uh, very cost prohibitive and um, is not uh, really feasible for for uh, widespread use. Okay, so this will be the last slide of our semester. So the final concept I want to introduce to you guys is the idea of fractional distillation. And so this is a way of using colligative properties to purify a mixture of liquids. So the general setup that we have for fractional distillation, so say that we are separating out some water from ethyl, ethyl alcohol, okay? So that would be, um, excuse me, C2H5OH, okay? So ethyl alcohol, that is moonshine, okay? So if you have a mixture of, of water and alcohol, and say you start off with a 50-50 mixture between the two, okay? So equal composition of both. You're going to want to separate that out to separate the alcohol from the water. And so the presence of that alcohol into the water is going to change the boiling points of, of both of those materials. Okay, due to our colligative property, we know that our change in temperature for boiling is equal to Kb times the molality times our, our uh, von Hoff factor. And so what you're going to do is you're going to boil this, this mixture between the two. And so each of these individual components, the water and the ethanol, have slightly different boiling points from each other, okay, where water has a higher boiling point and ethyl alcohol has a slightly lower boiling point. Okay, so you're going to see uh, when you boil this, this liquid here, you're going to see the gaseous phase is going to raise up through what's called a distillation column, reach a thermometer on the top, and then uh, the gas can then enter this arm phase of our distillation, uh, distillation glassware, and then it encounters a cooling chamber where there's water run on the outside to condense that vapor back into liquid again. And then you have a collection chamber here at the end that's going to collect that, uh, that vapor fraction back into liquid. And so the idea is the lower boiling point material, so in this case the ethyl alcohol, is going to be uh, in the vapor phase in a higher fraction than the higher boiling point material, which is the water. 
But you have to do multiple different um, distillation procedures in order to purify this material. And so what this plot over here shows on the right-hand side is we have temperature on the y-axis and the composition of the two different materials on the x-axis. Okay, so um, if we start off, and so on the in the green here, that is the, the uh, liquid phase, and in the uh, orange up here, that's going to be our vapor phase. So at any specific temperature, and then so this uh, gray region here is, is the thin region between curves represents the equilibrium between phases. So if you look at a specific temperature, so say about 95 degrees C, uh, 95 degrees Celsius here, we can see that in the liquid phase, we have a 50-50 mixture. But when we're talking about the gaseous phase, since that ethyl alcohol boils at a lower temperature than the water, we can see that the, that the gaseous phase is actually 71% ethyl alcohol and only 29% water. Okay, so the first distillation. So a lot of times, if you uh, if you see advertisements for for vodkas or for other alcohols that you drink, they talk about triple distilled. Okay, so this is a triple distilled process. So the first distillation, if you take a 50-50 mix uh, mixture, you're going to heat it up until you start to collect a fraction. And so that gaseous phase that you're going to end up collecting in the fraction will now be 71-29 composition. So you've started to eliminate some of that water impurity. Then when you, when you heat the next one, you need to require less heat now to collect your fraction. And then so at say that looks like around what, 87 degrees, your, your vapor phase that you're gonna collect in your receiver now is gonna be 8614. And then the third time you would distill that solution, it would get to 946. Okay, so the more times that you distill your mixture, the more pure your fraction is going to end up becoming. And so this is due to the change in boiling points associated with having impurities in the solution. All right, that's it for the class. Congratulations, and we'll see you around.